All right, welcome everybody. So uh, today we're doing a lecture on uh, some of my greatest losses. For me, it wasn't necessarily actually my best quality losses. I mean, very rarely do losses end up good quality, but for me, uh, I think good losses are instructive losses and losses from which we could all learn from, including myself, going forward. So today's lecture, we're gonna focus on the games that I mostly lost because of lack of sense of danger and allowing my opponent too much initiative and leaving my pieces not completely developed. As, you, as you'll see, even for me as a GM, that could sometimes be an issue and you know, no matter how good you are, you can never neglect that part of the game following the basic principles. So this is a game I played at the US Championship against uh, Grandmaster Alex Onishuk, you know, very famous Grandmaster, Hall of Famer, He's won a US Championship before, like, uh, very strong Grandmaster. I was black. In this game I played the Slav Defense. And he played Queen B3 trying to attack both my pawns and I played queen c7 indirectly defending the d5 pawn because of the bishop hanging so knight c3 e6 knight f3 knight c6 and now my opponent realizes that okay he has to play for something otherwise I'll just go h6 knight f6 bishop e7 comfortably developed so he goes knight h4 to try to go for my bishop pair at least trying to get something so I play bishop e4, that way if he takes, I want to leave his knight stranded. So he played bishop d2, I went here, he took, I took, and here my opponent played a very interesting ambitious move, d5. Um, it's a pawn sack, but it leads to very interesting play, which I wasn't able to handle in this game. So I took the pawn. Now he cannot take back, of course, because of the knight hanging. And if he takes again, I go back. But he goes knight f5. That was his idea all along. With two threats. Okay, so I go uh, knight f5. I go g6. And he goes back. So if he takes, he helps me develop. He didn't want to do that. And after this, he can go castles. Which is also okay for black. So he played knight d4. He's taking advantage of the fact that I've weakened myself a little bit. And now this pawn is kind of weak as well. I played queen d7, which is certainly an okay move. Although... Here I could have already started thinking about trying to develop my pieces. But queen d7 was maybe okay. There was also a possibility of takes, takes, queen d6. Takes, giving up some pawns, but taking on b2. And now I have some initiative. Of course, he doesn't have to take on b7. But this way of playing would have been interesting. It would have avoided a lot of problems that I had later in the game. I played queen d7. It's still not a bad move. Bishop b5, bishop f6. So of course I would love to go here, but then he's applying too much pressure on my c6 pawn. And I'm going to lose the pawn back and it's going to be a bit trouble for me. So I played this move with the idea of getting the knight to e7. But now he played a good move, bishop c3, which prevents my knight from going to e7 because then knight takes c6 is a winning tactic for white. Like if I take, he just takes, I lose the queen. Sorry, I don't lose the queen, but I, my rook then hangs. So it wasn't working. So I played the move. Um, so here I think a6 would have been the safest bet. Getting rid of that bishop, getting rid of the pin. And if bishop a4, I can meet it with b5. And if bishop takes c6, I can meet it with takes. And then I can develop knight e7, next move, where he doesn't have knight takes c6 anymore with all those tactics. And that would have been a sensible thing to do, get rid of the pin and just make sure that I find a way to develop quickly. The move I played, though, is a little bit too slow. It's a two-move idea. I played king f8, I want to go king g7, and then knight e7. But that's a little bit too slow because I'm still kind of leaving my pieces undeveloped and he has time to do stuff. So here he castled. 
And uh, yeah, and, and in this position, what do you think uh, black should do here? Oh uh, yeah? Uh, 97 I think doesn't work tactically because what are you gonna do after, yeah. So it still doesn't work, so I ended up playing king g7, but king g7 ran into a little bit of trouble, yes? Is, is there a better move than king g7? Yeah. Uh, Um, uh, knight takes d4. Knight Simply knight takes d4. Yeah. yeah, because if bishop takes d4, I go queen d6, and then king g7, and I trade off the bishops. And if queen a3, queen e7, bishop b4, I just go knight takes b5, and I get three pieces for the queen. So I would be totally fine here. Like bishop takes, knight takes, I would be fine. So I didn't do that. He played king g, but I played king g7. And now white played a good move, f3, opening up that rook. And I remember I missed that move when I, when I was playing the game. I remember that move came as a surprise to me. I thought I would be able to just complete my development, everything will be okay. But again, that's what you know good players do when you're behind on material, let's say down a pawn, but you have a lead in development. You have to play very energetically. You have to really play for initiative and try to, you know, as quickly as you can, open up the game to try to disturb the harmony and try to not let black consolidate. Otherwise, if you give me a couple of moves, I'll be better. I'll be up a pool and I'll be fine. But he found this good move f3. So now I took that because I don't want to do this. Because then I'll have problems dealing with this at some point in a lot of positions. For example, after this, now there's this. So... So then f3 came, knight takes d4, e takes d4. He doesn't want to take with the bishop because then he ends up trading the bishops off, ultimately. So he took with the pawn. But still, it's not easy for me. So I played queen d6, I, my queen's attacked. Takes, takes. Now he maybe could have played a little bit better. Maybe rook f2 was better than his move, but he played a logical move, bringing his last piece into the game, rook a1. And now it was my chance to, to sort of get back in the game here. Um, so who can tell us what should uh, Black do in this position? Bishop takes d4 check. Bishop takes d4 check. I'm afraid that will be um, a little bit dangerous. Um, let's see. Let's say I go here. I mean, I guess you can try knight of six, but. Or yeah, yeah, rook d1, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't think that. Well, this is a check, but after king h1, the problem is I can also do this intermediate move. So you can't even, yeah, so I don't think bishop takes d4 works. Uh, yeah. Which one? Yeah, a6 was the move to play. And uh, then after uh, bishop c4 or something, then I, then I think b5. Uh, let, me, let me just, I thought I had some analysis here. Where, where did it all go? Maybe it didn't save. Yeah, I think it's b5, bishop takes f7, and then bishop takes d4, yeah. Yes, that was it. I needed to get the bishop out, I, I needed to get the bishop to f7, actually, it's all but counterintuitive, I needed to force him to take my pawn, uh, but then the bishop is kind of in the way of his harmony, and then I can take, and then I can somehow survive with knight f6. Like, maybe I can do this, and then this. And then I can sort of survive here. But okay, this was hard to find. So as you could see, like I have a lot of practical difficulties here. But uh, I played rook c8. 
and he took the pawn and now I played rook c7 okay so I'm trying to somehow guard the f7 pawn that's why I played rook c8 rook c7 but it's too slow he goes bishop b4 now he's not even down a pawn and he has a huge lead in development and here I decided to go for it and grab the pawn but now this is just lost for me king h1 basically I, I was playing too many moves to, with, that, with my knight on g8 and rook on h8 and whenever that ha ends up happening it usually doesn't lead to good things it usually means that you have to be play very very precise just to survive but you can't really think of being better you have to play very very carefully so I needed to avoid the scenario that's why I think my king f8 king g7 was way too slow given that my knight was not developed I needed a6 so that get the bishop to take on c6 immediately then knight e7 or I needed to play a little bit more carefully earlier but I could not have allowed my knight to be on g8 like that so queen b6 and now okay he, he missed a very nice win actually so I'll give you a chance to see if you can find it he found a prosaic way to win but there was a much nicer shot here for white that he missed uh yes well bishop f8 i think i'm taking that right yeah any other ideas yes oh uh, rookie eight um i think i can play knight f6 defense yeah the move is very nice it's a uh, two move tactic you know it's uh you're, you're right you're lo you should be targeting that eight square in some ways but you need to find uh, you have to look for all your checks captures and and threats it's a nice little tactical idea for white yes very good very good addy right Rook e6, yes. And this is a killer because after this, this is checkmate. And after this, this is bishop f8. So this is what can happen if your pieces are not developed. He didn't find that. He played rook takes d4, also winning, and then bishop c3. And then I had to take that. Takes. Queen d6. Now he takes here. And then he transposed it into an endgame. Which is also probably winning, but okay. He, I think he could have won easier like here he's gonna win all my pawns and i'm still in very bad yeah here he found a nice little finesse he played rook f7 you know just you know emphasizing the fact that i cannot develop my pieces like if he at least if he got my if i was able to get this in somehow and then rook e8 rook d8 i mean even though i'll be down a couple of pawns i maybe have some slight chances of surviving but he never gave me that chance he played rook f7 nice move keeping my knights like this and this is just like a symbolizing game in that way because my knight on g8 and rook on h8 never got in the game because until it was too late okay so rook f8 and finally i had to work very hard to bring the king back just to but now i'm losing all my pawns under very bad circumstances and finally the knight somehow gets in but this end game is of course totally hopeless down two pawns and eventually he converted that. I'll show you a couple of more moves, but here I resigned. I mean, the pawn on C file is just pushing and there's nothing I can do, of course, down two pawns. Yeah, so that was the US Championship game against Onishuk, which, you know, I knew it was gonna be a fighting game, but of course I was hoping it would go a bit better. Now I'm gonna show you another interesting fighting game I had. This is against an Indian player, Karthikian. He he's only he was only 25, 30 feet there at that time. But this was the last round game of a London tournament, which sadly I lost it, which was a little bit annoying at that time. But to give him credit, my opponent played very, very well this game. And he took advantage of my slightly awkward uh, piece placement and played very nicely with the initiative. By the way, this guy, I don't feel as bad about losing to him now because this guy beat Vachir Lagrav Maxim in Gibraltar last round this year. 
and scored 8 out of 10 in Gibraltar, getting clear second behind, I think it was uh, Artemiev. So, like in such a strong tournament, 8 out of 10 is like winning a tournament. So, definitely a very strong player. I was black. And this was a French. And he played an interesting move, knight e4. The idea of that move is that if he goes knight f3, he didn't want me to go bishop before check. And now if c3, he can take, I can take on c3, take on c3, take on c3, and then take on d4. So that's the idea of knight e4. He's trying to prevent that, so that after this, I just, he just goes c3. I think it was an interesting improvisation over the board. So I decided to play a move bishop d7. Now, this, I would say, was one of the reasons that I lost the game. Because I put this bishop on d7, but this bishop kind of restricts my knight. And the problem with this move is that, even when he plays a neutral move, uh, my, my goal was to go knight c6. But the problem is, I'm not really threatening this move because he goes knight b5. So I still can't really continue my development. So this move was a little bit illogical, and it obstructed my development. And as you'll see later on, this bishop was a problem for me a lot tactically. So that's why it's important to, in the very beginning, try to develop in the most natural way. Try to just uh, complete your development in the most logical way. I didn't want to go bishop e7, I thought he'll go queen g4, but thing is I can go king f8 or even castle here. And uh, I was afraid of bishop h6, but okay, bishop f6 is not so bad. With my pieces in no normally placed, I would be fine. But I put my bishop on d7. It was a little bit of one of these moments where I overcomplicated things, overanalyzed. Okay, so he played c3. Possibly bishop c4 was even better, but c3 is okay. And now I realized I don't want to go knight c6 anymore because of knight b5. Although I, maybe I can still play queen b8 and be fine. But I uh, decided to play bishop e7 now. I thought bishop d7, c3 will be in my favor, but it turns out it wasn't so. He played queen g4, principled move. I castled. He developed a bishop to h6, like I expected. I played bishop f6. And he castled. And in this position, I thought that my opponent blundered. Or at least I thought, hmm. Um, I thought my position is very good. So I played the move bishop e5. And here it looks like he's in very, very big trouble. Uh, because it looks like I'm threatening f5. This is protected. And, uh, I mean, what is he going to do about that? The problem, though, is that his development is actually better than mine. So, you see, we're both castled. Uh, but he has two knights developed, the bishop. I have, okay, also knight, bishop, bishop developed. But it's his move. And, uh, as you see, my queen side is still not fully developed. So... He's definitely not behind on development. I would say he's probably slightly ahead because it's his move. And he does have one more piece developed than I do. And, you know, you can't really call my bishop on d7 being developed. So, what do you guys think white should do here in this position? Uh, yeah, white, yeah. Yes, yeah, you have to play f4. Because uh, if you don't play f4, you know, you're just going to lose. The thing is, though, amazingly enough, despite all the opportunities I have in the position, position is actually not so clear. I mean, and here I thought for a while. So, okay, so I started with the move 93, and I thought, ooh, this is, like, fantastic. I mean, now I'm forking his rook and the queen. The problem, though, is that I'm not really developing new pieces with that. Now, if f5, queen g3 would have happened, and then I'm not really doing anything tactically-wise. Because if he takes this, I t he, if I take that, he takes here, and now there's a mate threat, so I cannot take the knight. If he takes, I take, there's again a mate threat. So 
Uh, I'm not winning material with f5, queen g3. So I played knight e3. And now he played queen g3. I mean, queen h3, sorry. Queen g3 would have, the more natural move would have been met by takes, takes, and then knight f5. And now my queen's being attacked. I mean, his queen's being attacked, sorry. And the white is losing. So he played queen h3. Bishop takes d4. Rook takes d4. Knight f5. And here I thought, okay, still everything is in control and I'm gonna win material here. But even despite the fact that, you know, I'm winning material, somehow white is doing very well because he still has a very big lead in development. Basically, the rook got more into the game and I traded off some of my developed pieces. I helped his rook develop even more. And now he goes bishop g5 again with a tempo, attacking my queen. I played f6 and he just went back rook d2. And then I had this position in front of me. And I thought about this position for like ages. Bec I mean, at this point I had like one hour and my opponent had something like 10 minutes left. So it was clear he was a little bit improvising, but his intuition somehow in this game was very good that he was always gonna be fine. And indeed the engine later showed that white's doing very well here. But I was like sitting here and thinking, how on earth do I get an advantage? Because I thought like so many, like his bishop is hanging and I thought somehow I should be doing well, but then the more I started looking at lines, the more I realized it's not so clear. And I spent like more than 30 minutes here, and I ended up choosing the best move, queen c7. Well, the problem again is, my pieces are not coordinated, bishop on d7 is not very well placed, and my rook and the knight, this time on the queen side, are not properly developed. And that's why my position, even though I'm winning material, the tactics are not really working in my favor. For example, if f takes g5, you know, knight takes g5, h6, he can take that, take that, and then he can play a move like bishop d3, and uh, materially it's roughly equal, but I mean, if anyone's better, it's him, he has all this initiative. And my pieces are still not in the game, my queen side. So it's kind of a problem. So what to do? So I thought about some other moves, but then I realized that he's also just threatening g4. So, and then, you know, maybe sacrifice on f6 and go g5 and just completely crash through on the king's side, ultimately. So, I played the move queen c7 with the idea of at least getting the queen off of some pins and also add pressure here. Alright, so now we need to continue energetically with white. So, white played g4. Keeps going for it. So, I took on g5. Now, what do you think... A white would do if knight e7 is played. How does white continue his attack? Yes? Uh, bishop takes of 6, g takes of 6. And g5. Yes, very good. Just continue that initiative. And again, I looked at that, I was analyzing that, I didn't like it, and indeed it was kind of busted for me. I mean, materially I'm okay, but uh, my pieces are not developed, so temporarily he's kind of up material and uh, he's not gonna give me a couple of moves to consolidate so I played takes he took and I took here he took this and I played g4 uh, I think if this move I think e7 was a problem and then some queen e6 and some tactics there so he played g4 and I played g4, he played queen h4, and I took that. But now he just completes his development, and now you, again, you can see that he's able to develop all of these new pieces, he still has an attack, and I still can't quite develop my pieces because of too many threats. So it's a big problem for me. So I played bishop d5, trying to pin that knight to the rook. And now here we go, knight of 6 starting for the nice attacking combination attacking plan and this move I just did not see knight of six I thought of some other moves for him but knight of six I didn't see but it works my pieces are and again the thing is he does not have to calculate it all like ahead of time like all the lines he just can intuitively feel that white's much better because all his pieces get into the game and my queen side is not playing and I don't have time to get it in the game And now king f7 is met by queen h5. 
with a continued attack. So uh, basically king e7, rook e1, rook e6, but now white has a crushing attack. And the rest is kind of an agony. I was playing on because he was very low on time, but the problem is he is only down one piece for like uh, for a pawn, but his attack is just too strong. My king is now not safe, and so finally I gave up a rook to get my knight out, but of course that wasn't going to save me either. And uh, here I resigned because if king moves up, then rook e2, and, and now I'm down a queen. So once again, you know, last time against Onishuk it was the king's side, against uh, this guy was the queen's side. So you see how if you play a little bit awkwardly in the beginning, you know, especially if you're black, you can end up stuck in a situation like this where you, you're not able to complete your development, even when you want. So that's why it's so important in the very, very beginning to really pay attention to that. Because if you're playing a good player who's very energetic, good with initiative, you know, they can really punish you. And the last game that really got to me in that regards was a game I played against Lianga Wonder. Uh, and that was actually here in St. Louis Chess Club. It was not at the US Championship, it, it was in one of the classics. Um, and uh, after I lost that game, I remember um, I wanted to quit chess because uh, it was a very painful game, you know, because I thought, you know, he was only 14 years old at that time, only an international master. Like he was killing everybody in that tournament. Like it was like, he after this game, he had five and oh. And I remember that game, like, I I had a very tough draw the day before where I blew a completely winning position. And then I really came back to try to fight hard in that wonder game. Like, I really came to play, you know, focused. I felt like I really absolutely did my best. And then I got demolished like this. And I felt like if this is, if you know, if this is going to be my best, uh, then I have no hope in chess. I was thinking, uh, you know, at least not at the elite level. And I thought, okay, if... If not the elite level, then I might as well do something else, coach or whatever. So that's kind of uh, one of these turning point games for me where I just, you know, really um, got discouraged. But then as I thought more about that game, I realized that, well, the reason I lost that game was it was the same pattern. It was just continued lack of sense of danger. And I realized I have to just pay attention to that much more in my games. And then I, you know, ever since that game, I don't remember, you know, the next time I lost quite this kind of way. Um, so at least I was happy. And then actually I won a game because of someone else, another GM kind of violating some principles, which I was happy about. Uh, of course, I cannot show that game here because it's uh, losses, but maybe some other time. But in any event, this game against the Wonder, it's actually a very instructive game from a lot of standpoint of view. I show it to all my students now. It's great instructive game so in, the, in this game i'm black a wonder liang at that time a 14 year old international master but about to become a grandmaster now he's like a you know a, a constant fixture in the u.s championships always winning the u.s juniors um so we played the opening and uh, in this game he uh decided to sacrifice a pawn for the initiative and I took it, which is certainly fine. So now we have a normal position where, you know, he has a, a lead in development and, and I have an extra pawn. So the position is uh, dynamically equal here. So question to you guys is, um, what plan would you choose here as black and, and why? This is, a, this is where I made a mistake and this is where a lot of people make mistakes. Uh, yes? Uh, bishop c5, okay. Let's say I play um, rook d1. Mm-hmm. 
going to three. Which which way? Well, queenside bishop g5, kingside rook d7. Well, you have to castle a queenside, but I don't know. You're going to be down in exchange here. Okay. And, okay, I don't think you... I mean, my rooks are going to be pretty active. And, I mean, that's just the first thing that comes to mind, but maybe there's something else besides that. There could be this idea, I don't know. Don't know if that quite works. I think bishop c5 is a bit loose, don't you think? Because my rook gets to d1 quickly and... You know, I can start no. bothering that queen. Knight e5 the does get rid of the bishop pair. It's a very tempting move. I would have loved to play that, but it runs into a tactical problem. Bishop takes oh, c6. Yeah. And in fact, every knight move runs into a tactical problem. Knight c5, there's bishop takes c6. Knight f6, same thing. I mean, I would love to play one of these moves, but I can't. And I mean, it's like I, I wanted to play those moves so much that... I played a move rook c8, defending that c6 pawn and then trying to go knight c5 or knight f6. But the problem with that move is it's too clumsy. The rook c8, it's like one of these bishop d7 moves in the previous game. Rook c8, it stares at that pawn. Okay, it does one function, but it really it's all it does. But the rook is kind of stupid there. And as you'll see later, I ran into tactics because of that rook. So it's kind of violated some logical principles. So it would have been much better in a position like that to just focus on completing the development but it's not easy because he wants to play rook d1 and so that's why the main problem in this position is the queen so let's just get the queen out of here to b6 where it defends this you get out of a tempo and then you just simply want to play knight f6 bishop e7 castles and black really has no problems i mean white has compensation you know but white will never be you know better in this position I can also have played rook d8 with the same idea, and then let's say if, if, uh, if after rook d8, if rook d1, then play queen f6. And then knight c5 might make at some point sense, but also just bishop e7. And again, you know, everything would have been okay. But, <coughs> but I played rook c8. Okay, the move is not terrible, but it kind of was a prelude to my problems later on in this game. <coughs> So rook d1, and now I played queen f6. Of course I cannot take this be yet because of rook b1, but I actually dared to take that pawn later. And as you'll see, that was <coughs> quite a big problem. So queen f6, he played, <coughs> I played. Now in this position, his best option is probably queen g3. Um, and then some initiative with bishop c2. Because I can't castle yet because of this move. That was quite subtle though. He played rook e1, which is also kind of natural. But now, I s I'd actually, I'm in this position, I'm doing okay. I played knight c5, uh, which is a move I always wanted to play. He played queen g3 now. And in this position, you know, normally I should just simply go bishop e7. Sure, I lose the pawn with bishop e5, but after queen g5... I don't really have any problems. Okay, I will lose the pawn back, but it will just be some equalish endgame. And as long as I complete my development, I should be okay. But I was thinking this. I thought my knight in c5 defends the b7 pawn. And so now I said, well, why can't I just take on b2? I mean, I didn't see a clear refutation to it. And I thought, wow, if I can win the pawn on b2 and get away with it, I might just you know, win the game. I'm up two pawns. And I was like really in a fighting mood and like I was just underestimating the danger. What I should have done instead is if I didn't see a problem with queen takes b2, I should have told myself, warned myself, this move is totally not logical. Like look at the quality of his pieces and look at the quality of my pieces. Like my pieces are not developed. My king is in the open. The game is open. His pieces are all playing. And yet I'm decentralizing my queen or going all the way on b2. And then taking this pawn, I mean, something must be wrong here. Now, I might not see what exactly is it, but this is the only kind, the kind of move it's okay to play. If I've thought about it for like 30 minutes to 45 minutes and really 
worked hard to look for opponent's ideas here and still couldn't find it. Okay, then you should trust yourself and, you know, if you don't see it, you play it. But to play it in like 5-7 minutes of thinking, that's not good enough. I mean, whenever you play a move that you feel is a little sketchy, you really have to make sure you think quite deeply about it at the very least. And I would say if it's like a quicker game, you should just intuitively avoid playing such a move. You know, just going, going based on general logical principles. Because again, you can't really calculate everything in every position. You have to just go based on general feel. So now my opponent played a nice move, bishop f5. And uh, basically this is a move I missed. Well, rather maybe I saw that move, but I thought that I can just get away with queen f6. And I thought I will be doing okay here after queen f6. But it turns out from like move back, I missed that in this position, white has a very powerful resource. Exactly. Yeah. Before um, he went bishop f5, would bishop and e5 been okay? Bishop e5 is okay, but then I, that I thought I was pre prepared against. I thought I'll go knight takes e4. And then I think I calculated rook takes e4, queen takes c2. And I think if queen d3, I can even go knight c5 also. So I thought I can be fine here after bishop e5. But that's why he played bishop f5. He safeguarded the bishop and he still has the bishop e5 idea. And I thought now I can bring the queen back. But it turns out I can't because white has now tactical possibility. I think I see it. What is it? Bishop where? g5. Bishop g5, queen takes. And queen c7. Yes, very good. Very simple tactical idea nice. so and there you go that, that is my rook on c8 <laughs> I told you that will let itself know it just seems like whenever you do something a little bit awkward it always lets itself know later on in the game it just finds a way to like rear its ugly head you know that's why it's very important to follow logical principles in chess so I had to you know take on a2 to try to almost like safeguard e6 but of course, it's not a move I wanted to play. At this point, I already knew I'm, 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 it's very dangerous. But I was still hoping that maybe I'll somehow survive. But he was very good with the initiative. So he played bishop d6. You know, that's trying to remove my main defender of a lot of key squares. Uh, so I played queen a5. Uh, he took on c5. And another idea was to remove the guard. Because you guessed that. He wants to do this. Takes, takes. Okay, so now what to do? Well, he can. I can play king f7 or bishop e7. If king f7, then queen b3 is kind of a problem. I mean, I looked a little bit at queen b5, but then check here. Queen f3, h6, check. I didn't see this whole line, but this line just demonstrates that it's bad for black. And if queen b2 to defend mate, I believe there's check, check check I mean check and here so there's a mating attack in every case here so that didn't work I mean I, I played in bishop e7 already more intuitively and now he played rook d e1 which is okay but it does blow a big part of his advantage now I'm sure the move he wanted to play was rook e5 now the idea is, you know, if the queen moves, then he can start going c3, and then queen takes g7, and then he just has a very big attack here. So, I was going to actually castle here. And I was thinking this, if this, this, you know, now I'm threatening here, I can go rook f7. Materially, it's actually not so bad for me. I have rook and a, I have rook and a bishop for the queen, and I have also a pawn. So I thought I have a good chance to hold the draw here at least, somehow. But in this position, I think what we both missed is that there's a brilliant move rook d7. He doesn't take the queen right away, but he goes rook d7 first. And uh, then I have nothing better anyway to take on, than take, to take on e5. But then I'm giving up a queen under much worse circumstances. And this is probably technically lost. Uh, so instead, my opponent played rook e1, and here I made a mistake. 
So it was a miscalculation. I thought I'm surviving after castles, but it turns out I'm not. If I would have seen what was waiting for me after I castle, like it's like I wanted to finally castle, but it was, I didn't see deep enough that I'm losing. So I could have played rook f8 or even g6 and I was afraid of positions like this, but of course here, like I'm out of like immediate danger and I think I have very good chances to draw here, ultimately. But in the game, I played uh, castles, rook e7, rook f7. And here's the critical position, uh, the final big critical position of the game. How does white win here? Find a forced win here. So I'll give you guys some time, like you know, a few minutes. Um, try to find the forced win. I thought I'm fine here still. I thought it's like... Uh, I saw some ways I can get a worse position, but nothing that, you know, I thought I'll lose like in five moves. But it turns out I actually am losing in five moves here. Four moves actually. You know. uh, yes, add Addy. Yeah, queen b3 is, uh, you know, of course, I, that's like one of the first moves I saw. But then I can take an f2. Did you see that? King h1, yes. But, you know, even still, you you have a nice threat here, rook e8. But I can still, you know, kind of successful, I think, defend against it. Rook f8, for example. Take an f7, I can take queen takes. Because queen e1, rook f1. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> white wins but I, I take on f7 yeah I mean I can, that's number one I can take on f2 number two I can also go queen d5 I can block your queen and again, again there's it might be an advantage but there is no force to win at least black is surviving so queen b3 I saw that move it's certainly very tempting but it doesn't quite win like I would have been happy if he played queen b3 but uh, he plays something else here. Yeah. Uh, rook e8 check. check. Takes, takes. Rook f8. Uh, Again, very oh. tempting based on this idea. I'm sure you got in, fell in love with this idea, but uh, queen d5 again. And again, you could be up a pawn maybe, but you know, I have very good drawing chances. So that queen d5 idea is. So you need to find a variation where you at least get rid of immediate queen d5. You know, that's kind of the first step of the equation. You have to notice the queen d5 ID and then find a way to kind of prevent it. Uh, uh, Addy, what do you think? Rook 1e5. Well, rook 1e5, I think I can even do queen takes e7. So, and then takes, takes. And plus, it's, I mean, I have other possibilities maybe as well. Queen c4, but queen e7, I think I'll be better then. Uh, so again, find a line where at least you get rid of the queen d5 defense in the beginning. You know, again, sometimes, you know, I'm not saying queen b3 is the wrong idea. You, sometimes you have to just, whenever you see a tactic in one way, you have to sometimes look for a transposition of the move order, yes? Rook f7 first, very good. King f7, now queen b3, yeah. Because of queen d5, now we have this. So at least we got rid of queen d5. That's already a very big accomplishment. Now I have to go king f8. So now we're already looking at something. Now this is already, we can go queen b7 at the very least. But here we have something much better than queen takes b7. Find a way to win, yes? Rook where? e2. Oh, e3. Rook e3, yes. I mean, that's possible. I'll go queen d5, though. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, queen b7, rook to e8. Again, uh, white has a very big advantage here, but at least black is surviving for a little bit. And uh, well, maybe it's not totally lost, at least. Even though it's pretty close to lost, but there's a way to win the game, like, in a way that, you know, I have to resign in, like, two moves. Like, there's basically a two-move idea here that really just finishes the game completely. Queen e6, very good, excellent. Queen e6. And then the rook has to move to d8, probably, and now... Rook e5, very good, with a tempo. Because it's still not too late to mess up. Rook here, here, queen d6, black is better. Suddenly, check. But rook e5 does the job, and that is lost. And now I have to lose the queen or get mated. I chose as a good sport to get mated. Usually, you know, if my opponent plays a great game and he has an attack going like this, I usually let them mate me in such situations. I mean, I don't, I don't play till mate in a lost endgame or something like that, but I, you know, would let them mate me in a middle game like this. If. But during the game I was fine, but after the game I was so upset, you know, you can't imagine. You know, I gave it like such a good effort and then like I worked harder than I ever do during game, but maybe psychologically I had something a wrong approach and I took too much on my shoulders, I don't know. And it was one of these just very bad games for me. And uh, but again, the good news for us is now we have more material to learn from. And, you know, now it's like that game is history. It's more than two years ago. And uh, now we can just uh, laugh about it. But certainly at that time, it was very, very unpleasant. All right, we still have a little bit of time left. So I'll show you my game against Fabi, which, and that was a total disaster. That was, uh, uh, that was an embarrassment. Uh, that, was a, that was one of the games that I lost to him in 2018 US Championship in round two. And in case some of you followed it, yeah, I lost that game in like less than two hours. So it's like embarrassing to play in the US Championship and to lose a game in two hours. But it was just one of these days when nothing was working for me. I didn't, I got ran, I ran into like an opening line that I didn't know. Um, I was just not feeling that great that day. I was over prepared. I just, you know, I was just not fresh and I was just not seeing things very well that day. And it was just a bad combination. It was just a bad game. I want to forget as soon as possible. But still something to learn from. In this game, I'm black. And I gave the French defense a very bad name, unfortunately, in this game. <laughs> so sorry to you guys who play French. No, French is actually a much better opening than I gave it credit in this game. Um, so here I decided to play the, you know, I think it's called the blues variation uh, or something like that. Uh, Queen a4. I actually remember I prepared this opening specifically for the US Championship and I thought I had to analyze it well. But then my opponent came up with a surprise idea, h4. And it turns out he read something on uh, some new in chess article or it was, or maybe it was uh, not new in chess, but some other magazine. And he saw that the idea is interesting and he didn't even, he said he didn't even analyze it deeply, but he said, okay, let's just play it. He decided oh, during the game. The thing is, uh, the reason I wanted to play this line is because I know that Fabi beat Naroditsky, Daniel Naroditsky, a strong grandmaster, in the previous year's US Championship. And I had an improvement over that game. So I thought, maybe I'll get the chance to get that in and then I'll get a good position. But of course, Fabi, as a very well-prepared player, he knew that and uh, he decided to deviate first, which was very smart. And unfortunately, I was not well-prepared for it. Now. If you are dealt with a surprise in the opening, the best thing to do is just try to, again, follow general logical principles. And then usually things will be kind of okay. So in this position, what would make sense is, well, we know in the French, b6, bishop a6 is a very logical idea. Uh, but the thing is, the knight, on, the knight on g8 probably needs to be developed almost no matter what, right? You cannot play with the knight on g8. And it's not going to go to h6 because, you know, it's too weakening like this. So, knight e7 is a move I would need to play no matter what at some point, right? 
Whereas knight on c6 could wait, because maybe after b6, bishop a6, the knight might want to go to d7, or even a6. So just from this standpoint of view, logical principle, being flexible, don't declare your intentions, it would have been much better to start with this move. Instead, I played this. It seems like I kind of got unnerved. He played h5. So, okay, he wants to play h6 and weaken my dark squares, so I played h6. And he played queen d1, so the idea was he pushed that pawn up the board, he made my king move to f8, and now he can move the queen back to guard some of his weaknesses. So in the game, I took on d4. Now this move is already kind of very risky. Again, I'm behind in development and here I am grabbing pawns in the center. It would have been much more sensible for me to play b6, and then again, trade off the bishops. Although here already it's not as good of a version for me with the knight on c6, but it still would be kind of acceptable for me. Instead of that, I went for pawn grabbing, and then I went for pawn grabbing again. Thought, I'm a, I have an extra pawn and everything will be kind of okay. But then suddenly, in this position, I realized I'm in quite deep trouble, because white has a very, not very subtle threat here. What is white's threat here in this position? Yeah. Rook h4. So if I play b6, rook h4 would trap my queen in the <laughs> in a very funny way. Well, okay, I can play d4, but okay, that's kind of pathetic. And then I'm giving up a pawn and still have lots of problems. And then the rook is going to come over to d8. So this is going to be lost. So I ended up playing... I didn't want to go knight b8 or something and then go queen d7. I thought this would be way too awkward. Passive. So I ended up deciding to play g5 with the idea of stopping rook h4 and after this queen e4 and bringing the queen here. But of course that was um, very, very uh, suspicious to say the least. Because now my king is even weaker, even though my queen is kind of doing okay, it's still going to always be under attack. And my opponent played a pretty smart move, okay, he just goes queen d2, getting the queen in the game. I played knight e7, and bishop d3. And here, okay, I mean, normally I should just go queen g7. I'm still much worse, but I'm surviving. But here, somehow my brain was just completely not working. And I thought, I'll, I'll take on g2, you know, pawn grabbing. Figure, okay, I thought he was going to go takes, and then I was going to take, take, queen g7, and maybe I'm doing much worse, but at least I'm not losing right away. But I completely forgot that my opponent could just go king e2. It was just one of these days that I was not seeing anything. And then he connects his other rook and suddenly I, I have... I mean, my queen is threatening to be trapped again. And uh, yeah, I played queen g4. So I'm hoping to go here or something. He goes here. Then he goes there. Yeah, and the rest is, as you can probably guess, will not end up well. Technically, I'm, I'm up two pawns, but okay, who cares about two pawns in such a position? He played rook f4. Of course, I can take with check, but then I lose my queen. The queen gets trapped. So he goes knight e7, bishop b4, pinning me there, a5. Now he takes this, and, and here I resigned. <laughs> I'm, I've fallen into a double pin, and now I'm gonna lose massive material. So at this point, I knew, you know, enough is enough. So again, you know, what it comes down to is, you know, following basic principles, development. You know, it comes down to sometimes very the basics, you know. And as you could see, even for me as a GM, once in a while I'll have, I'll have games that, you know, um, I violate these principles. And that should give you guys all hope that if you're playing a higher rated, that just because they do something sketchy doesn't mean what they're doing is good. Sometimes they can also play very bad chess. If a grandmaster can play very bad chess once in a while, you know, your 2100 opponent or whatever, 1800 opponent who is sometimes higher rated can also sometimes do bad things. And you have to make sure you trust yourself, not your opponent. You have to trust your chess education, trust your judgment, and don't, you know, believe your opponent if he does something that you haven't seen necessarily. And uh, that's the key thing, you know. You gotta believe in yourself if you want to 
become a better chess player. That's without that, it's very hard. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope. Do you guys have any questions for me on uh, today's lecture? Well, do you have any su uh, suggestion after you have a big loss like that? How do you shake it up? Do you have any tricks that you use? And um. Okay. So um, the game against the Indian guy was the last. The question was, uh, how do you shake off a tough loss, you know, after? Yeah. So, well, um, the the loss to the Indian player uh, was the last round game, so obviously there was no time to recover in that tournament. But I had to just, you know, some time to recover after that tournament and just go go on to the next tournament and play that tournament as if nothing happened. The loss to Fabi, it was easy to overcome in a way because. I thought, okay, if I might as well play my worst game of the tournament, it might as well be against Fabi with Black, a game that I might lose potentially anyway. So if, if this is the game I'm going to play horribly, might as well be this one. Just, you know, get it out of my system. It's a quick game. Now I have a chance to rest. And in some ways, losing a game like that is easier to handle than, uh, you know, tough loss where you play for five hours and still lose. You spend all the energy. Then you're tired for the next game a little bit. And then you still end up losing. So um, in a way, a loss like that was very easy to shake off. Just like as if it just didn't happen. To completely wash it away. And then play the next from now on the turn as if nothing happened. So this loss with Fabi was easy to shake off. Um, the loss against the Wonder was probably the toughest for me. Because it was kind of like in the middle of the tournament. And I was trying to beat the Wonder to get back in the tournament. To fight for first place. And after this, I knew that I can't really realistically fight for first place anymore. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was just like a helpless feeling. I actually, there was a rest there right after that. It was just kind of like, yeah, it's like I, it was very hard to actually, you know, play the rest of the tournament. I managed to finish okay. I think I got third place or something in that tournament. But that loss was very uh, kind of, uh, it, it like, it, w it, it hit me deeply, so to speak, you know, the wonder game. So some losses are certainly harder than others. And, um, only sure game it was early in the tournament you know in a u.s championship i started like slowly half out of three but i remember i actually took that loss pretty well i thought okay i got outplayed he played better i mean he he understood some things you know better than me and i kind of also was able to so i mean yeah i mean over the years i've learned to i think handle learn to shake off and handle losses better than i did in the past I think one of the things that helps is uh, not being overly obsessed with the result, but instead, the short-term result, I mean, and instead focusing on the process. I think the most important thing, the most important way to view a bad result, you know, whether it's a, a loss or especially a tournament, bad tournament is like a wake-up call. So if you feel like you're not, not, not doing something that you're supposed to, and then you have a bad result, then okay, great. It's a wake-up call, then that means you have to just start doing the things that you're supposed to be doing to improve on your game. Now, if it's a um, bad result um, where you don't even know what you did wrong, then if you have a coach, then maybe they can help you, you know, try to analyze and what went wrong. Uh, or it could be something just like one of these situations where once in a while we just have a bad result as a test. Like possibly it's because like in the past we haven't handled a, re a bad result in a good way and life is sending us the test again to see if we this time can handle a bad result with more dignity. That's what I always tell all my students because I know that it's happened to me a lot of times. Like whenever I did not handle a loss at a certain critical moment in a good way, I know that I might have to deal with that test again like to deal with an unpleasant loss. So then I know that I better deal with the loss in a good way because otherwise I'll keep getting tested. And certainly that test is not pleasant. It's like, you know, when we're in school, when we were in school, let's say, or when we are in school, if we fail a test or fail a class, we need to retake it. So same thing in life, you know, when we fail a life test, usually we have to take it again. So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one story which I think is kind of relevant. I remember when I was a younger player, younger GM, I had this habit of whenever things did not go my way, my way, I just didn't really want to fight the rest of the tournament when it was like nothing to play for. Even though there's always something to play for, you can always learn from any game, every game, but I just didn't really want to hear that. 
And at some point I was going through a slide and then I had another like one of these bad tournaments. And then I just decided, I told myself, you know what, this last round I'm gonna play it like it's my most important game ever in my life. Even though I was not playing for anything anyway, I mean it's like no money on stake, you know, I was already gonna lose rating, it was gonna be a bad tournament. But I still decided that my regimen before that game and my focus during that game will be as much as if it's like the most important game of my life. And I was very happy to actually finish that tournament off on a good note. I played a very good game in my last round. And then ever since that moment, it's been like over a year since, since that tournament that I've had to play like quote unquote a meaningless game. And I've gained over like 100 points ever since that moment. So sometimes, you know, when you pass a live test, things can really start clicking for you like in an unexpected way. So you have to just try to analyze like why the bad result happened. Try to think about what you can do better. If you can't think of, then you can ask a coach. And sometimes it can just be like a circumstance of something you did in the past. But as long as you're truly studying in the right way and you know that, then you have to just have faith that at some point things will turn around. So, you know, I guess, you know, that's, it's a long answer, but I think it's adequate.